Well, we're back with our story, The Land of Stories. It has been a few days since we read. I wonder if you guys are excited to find out what happens with Alex and Connor like I am. This is chapter three, a birthday surprise. Pencils down, Mrs. Peters ordered from the front of the classroom. Her students were taking a math test and she had been watching them like a prison guard the entire time. Pass your test to the front. Are any of your teachers like prison guards? Connor looked down at the test as if it were written in ancient hieroglyphics. Most of his answers were blank and he had just scribbled around the others to make it look like he had tried. He said a little prayer to himself and passed the test forward with the others. The tests were all passed to Alex who stacked them in a neat pile for Mrs. Peters. She always felt so refreshed after taking a test, especially one as simple as that one had been for her. Her brother's test caught her eye since it was the one with the least amount of writing on it. Alex knew Connor always tried his best at school, but his best never seemed to be good enough. She looked back at him wishing she could help him, and then it occurred to her, maybe she could. Alex looked up at Mrs. Peters and saw that she was busy looking at the notes in her lesson plan. Would her teacher notice if Alex quickly filled in a couple of answers for her brother? Was Alex even capable of doing something so blatantly wrong? Was it considered cheating if you were doing it on someone else's test? Would the gracious gesture cancel out the offense in the grand scheme of things? Alex was prone to overthinking everything, so she just did it. She quickly filled in some of her brother's answers, making her handwriting slightly sloppier than it usually was, and she handed the stack of tests to Mrs. Peters. It was the most spontaneous thing she had ever done. Thank you, Miss Bailey, Mrs. Peters said, making eye contact with her. Alex felt like the pit of her stomach had fallen out of her body. The excitement she had felt from her impulse was now overshadowed by guilt. Mrs. Peters had always trusted her. How could she do something so juvenile? Should she confess what she had done? What was the punishment for her crime? Would she feel this guilty for the rest of her life? She looked back at her brother. Connor let out a long but quiet sigh. And Alex sensed her brother's sadness and embarrassment. She could feel his hopelessness as if, as if it were her own. The critical wheels in Alex's head stopped turning. She knew she'd done the right thing, not as a student, but as a sister. I want you all to get out your homework from last night, Mrs. Peters commanded, and I would like you to briefly present your work in front of the class. The teacher regularly surprised the class with impromptu presentations to keep them on their toes. She took a seat on a stool in the back of the room, uncomfortably close to Connor's seat, so she could keep an eye on his consciousness. One by one, the students presented their assignments to the class. Besides a boy who thought Jack and the Beanstalk was about the alien abduction and a girl who claimed Puss in Boots was an early example of animal cruelty, all the students seemed to have interpreted the tales correctly. It was so hard to choose just one fairy tale to write about, Alex said as she animatedly presented her seven-page paper to the class. She is a bit of an overachiever, I think. So I selected the story, the theme of which is present in virtually every fairy tale and every story ever written, Cinderella. Her excitement was not shared by her peers. Many people have had issues with Cinderella, saying it has anti-feminist elements, Alex continued, but I think it that's completely ridiculous. Cinderella is not about a man saving a woman. It's about karma. Most of the class began daydreaming about other things. Mrs. Peters was the only person in the room who seemed even slightly interested in what Alex had to say. Think about it, Alex went on. Even after years of constant abuse from her stepmother and her stepsisters, Cinderella remained a good person with high hopes. She never stopped believing in herself and in the good of the world. And although she married the prince in the end, Cinderella always had inner happiness. Her story shows that even in the worst of situations, even when it seems no one in the world appreciates you, as long as you have hope, everything can get better. Alex let her mind linger on what she had just said. She questioned the last point she had made in her presentation. Was that really what Cinderella was about? Or was it what she needed Cinderella to be about? 
Thank you, Miss Bailey. Very well said, Mrs. Peters said, with the closest thing to a smile her face was capable of making. Thank you for your time, Alex said, and she nodded to the class. It's your turn, Mr. Bailey, the teacher announced. She was sitting so close to him that he could feel the warm breath from her nostrils on the back of his neck. Connor went to the front of the classroom, dragging his feet as if they were encased in concrete. He had never had trouble talking in front of the class, but he'd rather be anywhere in the world than presenting something in front of a teacher. Alex gave him an encouraging nod. I chose the boy who cried wolf, Connor said, going against his teacher's advice from the day before. Alex slumped in her seat. Mrs. Peters rolled her eyes. This was very disappointing. I know you're all thinking I went with the easiest one, Connor said. Except reading it again, I don't think the story is about the importance of honesty. I think it's about high expectations. Alex and Mrs. Peters both raised their eyebrows. Where was he going with this? Sure, the boy was a brat. I can't deny that, Connor continued, gesturing to the half-page paper he'd written. But can you blame him for having a little fun? Clearly, his village was having a bit of a wolf problem, and everyone was stressed out about it. He was just a kid. Did they really expect him to be perfect all the time? His presentation may not have been the best, but it certainly was catching the class's attention. And it makes me wonder. Why was no one watching this kid? Connor added. Maybe if his parents had kept an eye on him, he wouldn't have been eaten. I think the story is trying to tell us to keep an eye on our kids, especially if they're pathological liars. Thank you. Connor never tried to be funny. He was just painfully honest about his thoughts and opinions. This honesty always amused his classmates, but never his teacher. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Mrs. Peter said sharply, you may sit down now. Connor knew he'd blown it. He took his seat, resuming his position under his teacher's cold stare and warm breath. Why did he even bother trying anymore? It wasn't the end of a school day unless Connor left feeling completely worthless. There was only one person who was capable of making him feel better when he felt this way. Connor only wished he were still around. Mr. Bailey always knew when his son needed to talk to him. It didn't have anything to do with observation or intuition, but with location. Occasionally, Mr. Bailey would get home from work and find his son sitting up in the oak tree in the front yard with a contemplative look on his face. Connor, Mr. Bailey would ask, approaching the tree. Is everything okay, bud? Uh-huh, Connor would mumble. Are you sure? Mr. Bailey would ask. Yep. Connor would say unconvincingly. He was as vocal about his troubles as his sister was, but you could see it in his face. Mr. Bailey would climb up the tree and have a seat on the branch next to his son and coax out what was troubling him. Are you sure you don't want to talk about it, Mr. Bailey would continue? Did something happen at school today? Connor would nod his head. I got a bad grade on a test, he admitted on one occasion. Did you study for it? His father asked. Yes, Connor said. I studied really hard, Dad, but it's just no use. I'll never be as smart as Alex. His cheeks turned bright red with embarrassment. Connor, let me fill you in on something that took me a long time to learn, Mr. Bailey said. The women in your life all are always going to seem smarter. It's just the way it is. I've been married to your mother for 13 years, and I still have trouble keeping up with her. You can't compare yourself to others. But I'm stupid, Dad, Connor said, his eyes filling with tears. I find that hard to believe, Mr. Bailey said. It takes intelligence to be funny and tell a good joke, and you're the funniest kid I know. Humor doesn't help with history or math, Connor said. It doesn't matter how hard I try in school. I'm always going to be the dumb kid in class. Connor's face went white and expressionless. He stared off into nothing, so ashamed of himself that it hurt. Luckily for him, Mr. Bailey had an encouraging story for every situation. Connor, have I ever told you the legend about the walking fish? Mr. Bailey asked him. He looked up at his father. The walking fish? Connor asked. Dad, no offense, 
but I don't think one of your stories is going to make me feel better this time. All right, suit yourself, Mr. Bailey said. A few moments passed and Connor's curiosity got the best of him. Okay, you can tell me about the walking fish, Connor said. Mr. Bailey's eyes lit up as they always did just before he was about to tell a story. Connor could tell this is going to be a good one. Once upon a time, there was a large fish who lived in a lake by its himself, Mr. Bailey told him. Every day the fish would watch longingly as a boy from the village nearby would play with all the horses and dogs and squirrels on land. Is a dog going to die in the story, Dad? Connor interrupted. You know I hate stories when dogs die. Well, let me finish, Mr. Bailey went on. One day, a fairy came to the lake and granted the fish a wish. That's random, Connor said. Why do fairies always just show up and do nice things for people they don't know? Employment obligation, Mr. Bailey shrugged. But for argument's sake, let's say she dropped her wand in the lake and the fish retrieved it and she offered him a wish as a thank you. Happy? That's better, Connor said. Go on. The fish predictably wished for legs so he could play with the boy from the village, Mr. Bailey said. So the fairy turned his fins into legs and he became the walking fish. That's weird, Connor said. Let me guess. The fish was so freaky looking the boy never wanted to play with them. Nope. They became great friends and played together with the other land animals, Mr. Bailey told him. But one day the boy fell into the lake and couldn't swim. The walking fish tried to save him, but it was no use. He didn't have fins anymore. Sadly, the boy drowned. Connor's mouth hung open like a broken glove compartment. You see, if the fish had just stayed in the lake and not wished to be something else, he could have saved the boy's life, Mr. Bailey finished. Dad, that's a horrible story, he said. How does a boy live by a lake and not know how to swim? Dogs can swim. Couldn't one of them have saved him? Where was that fairy when the boy was drowning? I think you're missing the point of the story, Mr. Bailey said. Sometimes we forget about our own advantages because we focus on what we don't have. Just because you have to work a little harder at something, and that seems easier to others, doesn't mean you're without your own talents. Connor thought about this for a moment. I think I get it, Dad, he said. Mr. Bailey smiled at him. Now why don't we get down from this tree and I'll help you study for your next test. I told you, studying doesn't help, Connor said. I've tried and tried and tried. It never helps. Then we'll come up with our own way of studying, Mr. Bailey told him. We'll look at pictures of people in your history book and make up jokes about them so you'll remember their names. And we'll create funny scenarios to help you with all those math formulas. Connor slowly but surely nodded and agreed to it. Fine, he said with a half smile, but for future reference, I liked your story about the curvy tree much better. The walk home that day was very quiet. Alex could sense that her brother's presentation had left him a little tense. She tried breaking the silence every few steps with supportive comments, or at least she thought they were supportive. I thought you made a good point, she said sweetly. Granted, it's not a point I ever would have made. Thanks, Con replied. She wasn't helping. You may have overanalyzed it, though, Alex said. I do it all the time. Sometimes I read a story and interpret it the way I want to, rather than the way the author wanted me to. It just takes practice. He didn't respond. He still wasn't helping. Well, it's our birthday today, Alex reminded him. Are you excited to be 12? Not really, Connor admitted. It feels just like 11. But aren't we supposed to be getting a new set of molars soon? Come on, let's be positive, Alex insisted. Even though we aren't doing anything exciting for our birthday, we should stay optimistic. There are plenty of things to look forward to. One more year until we'll be teenagers. I suppose, Connor said, only four more years left until we can drive. And six years until we can vote and go to college, Alex added. That was all they could come up with. Their cheerfulness was hollow, and they both knew it. So they just stayed silent for the remainder of the walk. Even if they had the most extravagant party in the world waiting for them at home, birthdays were always going to be hard for them. School had been predictable. The walk home had been typical. The day had seemed normal. And there wasn't anything out of the ordinary to make their birthday feel special at all until they got home and saw a bright blue car pull into their driveway. Grandma? 
The twins said in perfect unison. Surprise! Yelled their grandmother, getting out of her car. She was so loud the entire neighborhood could hear her. The twins ran up with their huge smiles on their faces. They only saw their grandmother a couple times a year and were stunned to see her in the driveway with no prior warning. Their grandmother hugged both of them so tight they thought they'd pop. Well, look at you two, she said. You both look like you've grown a foot since the last time I saw you. Their grandma was a petite woman with long, graying brown hair that was pulled back in a tight braid. She had the warmest smile and the kindest eyes in the world, which wrinkled pleasantly when she smiled, just like the twins' dad's eyes had. She was cheerful and energetic, and exactly what the twins needed. She always wore bright dresses and her signature shoes with white laces and brown heels. She was never more than a few feet away from her large green travel bag and blue purse, and although their grandfather had died many years before, she always wore her wedding ring. We had no idea you were coming, Connor said. It wouldn't be a surprise if you knew I was coming, Grandma said. What are you doing here, Grandma? Alex said. Your mom called and asked me to stay with you while she went to work, Grandma told them. I couldn't let you spend your birthday alone, could I? Thank goodness I was in the country. Their grandmother was retired and spent most of her year traveling around the world with other retired friends. They traveled to mostly third world countries and read to six sick children in hospitals and taught other children of the communities to read and write. Come help me with the groceries, Grandma told the twins. She opened her trunk and the twins began unloading bags and bags filled with food into the house. It was enough food to last them for weeks. Mrs. Bailey was sitting at the kitchen table going through another stack of mail with the bright red warning labels on them. She quickly pushed them to the side when the twins and their grandmother paraded into the kitchen with the groceries. What's all this? Mrs. Bailey asked. Hello, dear, Grandma said to her. I'm planning on cooking the twins a huge birthday dinner and wasn't sure what you had in the house, so I went to the store and picked up a couple things. Their grandmother always had a talent for sugarcoating the truth. You didn't have to go to all this trouble, Mrs. Bailey said, shaking her head, unprepared for the kind gesture. It wasn't any trouble at all, Grandma said with a small but reassuring smile. Alex, Connor, how about you go get your birthday present from the front seat of my car and I'll catch up with your mom for a second, but don't open them until tonight. They happily did as she asked. Presents was a word that had been absent from their vocabulary for a long time. See, I told you, Alex said to Connor on their way to their grandmother's car. Optimism always pays off. Yeah, 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 Connor said. Half a dozen wrapped presents with bright bows, each marked to one of them, were waiting in the front seat of the car. The twins returned inside with their gifts. Their grandmother and mother were still having a conversation that they most likely weren't supposed to hear. Things are still tough, Mrs. Bailey said. Even after selling the bookstore, the house foreclosed, and we still have some debt and things unpaid from the funeral. But we're making it somehow. In a few more months, we'll be back on our feet. Grandma took Mrs. Bailey's hands into her own. If you need anything, dear, I mean anything, you know where to find me, she said. You've already helped so much, Mrs. Bailey told her. I don't know where we'd be now if it weren't for you. I could never ask you for anything else. You're not asking, I'm offering, Grandma assured. The twins knew if they were eased, if they eavesdropped any longer, they'd be caught. So they walked back into the kitchen with their presents. Well, I have to go back to work, Mrs. Bailey said, and kissed both of the twins on the top of their heads. Have a great night, you guys. I'll see you tomorrow. Save some celebration for me. She gathered her things and mouthed a meaningful thank you to their grandmother on her way out. Grandma put her things away in the guest bedroom and returned to the kitchen where she found the stack of bills Mrs. Bailey had put aside. She plopped the mail into her own purse with a smile, and that was that. Grandma loved helping people, especially if it was against their will. Let's get started on dinner, shall we? Grandma said, clapping her hands. Alex and Connor sat at the table and visited with their grandmother while she cooked up a storm. She told them all about her recent trips, the difficulties she and her friends experienced getting into and out of places, and all the interesting people she had met along the way. I've ne never met a person I didn't learn something from, Grandma said. Even the most monotonous people will surprise you. Remember that. She was cooking so many different things, it was impossible to tell which ingredient was going where. 
Everything she did was so fast, and she used almost every pan and dish they had. With every second that passed, the twins' stomachs growled louder and louder, and their mouths salivated more and more. Finally, after a few hours of aroma-teasing torture, they ate. Alex and Connor had become so accustomed to frozen dinners and takeout, they'd forgotten how good food tasted. There were plates of mashed potatoes and macaroni and cheese, oven-roasted chicken with carrots and peas and freshly baked rolls. Their kitchen table looked like the cover of a cookbook. Just when they thought they couldn't possibly eat any more, their grandmother pulled a huge birthday cake out of the oven. The twins were amazed. They hadn't even realized she had been baking one. She sang happy birthday and the twins blew out the candles. Now, open your presents, Grandma said. I've been collecting for you all year. They opened their boxes and were flooded with knickknacks from all the countries their grandmother had been to. Alex was given copies of her favorite books in other languages. Alice's Adventures in Wonderland in French, The Wizard of Oz in German, Little Women in Dutch. Connor got a pile of candies and tacky t-shirts that said things like, my crazy grandma traveled to India and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. They both received several figurines of famous structures like the Eiffel Tower and the Leaning Tower of Pisa and the Taj Mahal. It's crazy to think that places like this actually exist in the world, Alex said, holding an Eif Eiffel Tower in her hand. You would be amazed to know what's out there just waiting to be discovered. Their grandma said with a smile and a twinkle in her eye. A day with very low expectations had turned into one of the best birthdays they'd ever had. As the night grew later, the visit with their grandmother began to come to a bittersweet end. Since their dad had died, they'd never saw their grandmother for more than a day at a time, and there were always a few months between each visit. And she was always so busy with her travels. When do you leave? Alex asked her grandmother. Tomorrow, she said, as soon as I take you to school. The twins posture sink a bit. What's the matter? asked their grandmother, sensing their spirit sink. We just wish you could stay longer, Grandma. That's all, Connor said. We really miss you when you're gone, Alex added. Things are so gloomy here without Dad, but you make everything seem like it's going to be okay. Their grandmother's constant smile faded slightly, and her gaze drifted off toward the window. She stared blankly into the night sky and took a deep breath. Oh, kiddos, if I could stay every day with you, I would. Grandma said longingly, perhaps more disheartened than she intended to show. But sometimes life hands us certain responsibilities, not because we want them, but because we are meant to have them, and it's our duty to see to them. All I can ever think about is how much I miss you two and your dad when I'm away. It was hard for Alex and Connor to understand. Did she not want to travel as much as she did? Their grandmother looked back at them. Her eyes were bright with an idea. I almost forgot. I have one more gift for you, Grandma said, and jumped up and skipped into the next room. She carried a huge old book with a dark emerald cover titled The Land of Stories in gold writing. Alex and Connor knew what the book was as soon as they saw it. If their childhood could be symbolized by an object, it was this book. It's your old storybook, Alex proclaimed. I haven't seen that in years. Their grandmother nodded. It's very old and has been with our family for a long time. I take it with me everywhere I go and read it to the children in other countries, but I, now I want you two to have it. The twins were shocked by the gesture. What? Connor asked. We can't take your book, Grandma. That's the land of stories. It's your book. It's always been so important to you. Their grandmother opened the book and flipped through the pages, the entire room filled with its musty paper aroma. That's very true, said Grandma. This book and I have spent a lot of time together over the years, but the best times were when I read it to you, so I'd like to pass it down to you. I don't need it anymore. I have all the stories memorized anyway. She handed it to them. Alex hesitated, but finally accepted the book from her grandmother. It didn't feel right to take it. It was like receiving an heirloom from a relative who was still alive. Whenever you're feeling down on the days you miss your dad the most, or when you just wish I were here, all you have to do is open it up and we'll all be together in spirit reading along, Grandma told them. Now it's getting late and you have school tomorrow. Let's get ready for bed. They did as she asked, even though they were too old for it. Their grandmother insisted on tucking them into their beds like old times. Alex took the land of stories with her to bed that night. 
She gently flipped through the old pages, being careful not to tear them. Seeing all the colorful il illustrations of the places and characters again made her feel like she was reading an old scrapbook of sorts. She loved spending time reading about fairy tale characters more than anything. They had always felt so real and accessible to her. They were the best friends she had ever had. I wish we got to choose which world we lived in, Alex said, running her fingers over the illustrations. They were so inviting. In her hands was a world unlike the one she lived in. It was a world un unaltered by political corruption or technology, a world where good things came to good people, and a world she wanted to be a part of with, her, with all her being. Alex imagined what it would be like to be a character in her own fairy tale, the forest she'd run through, the castles she'd live in, and the creatures she'd befriend. Eventually, Alex's eyelids began to feel heavy. She closed the land of stories, placed it on her nightstand, clicked off her lamp, and began to drift off to sleep. She was just about to fade into unconsciousness when she heard a funny noise. A low humming sound filled the room. What in the world? Alex said to herself and opened her eyes to see what it was. She saw nothing. That's strange, she said. She closed her eyes once more and began to drift back to sleep. The humming noise began to buzz through the room again. Alex sat up and looked around her room and finally found what was making the noise. It was coming from inside the land of stories on her nightstand. And to her amazement, the pages were unmistakably glowing. I have to sneak a peek. We're not going to read it. But the next chapter is called The Land of Stories. And look at that picture. Oh my goodness, you guys. I'm super excited to find out what happens next. Okay, here's your challenge for today. Their grandma brought them things from places like... Um, the Eiffel Tower, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and the Taj Mahal. So my challenge for you is go look and see if you can find a picture of it and then use Legos to build it. And then take a picture of what you build and post it as a comment on this on Facebook. And if you do that, then you can be entered into one of our drawings for summer reading. So I hope you guys are enjoying the land of stories. I am, I think that her book do you think it looked like this? It said it was emerald green with gold lettering. I don't know. All right, you guys have a good day. Thanks for reading with me.